attempted to stay behind the scenes because of the nature of my job. For those who may not know me, my background is education, New York City, South Central Bronx. New York in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Spent a lot of time in the streets educating our children. I started as a, um, well, I started teaching in Gary, Indiana, as a high school teacher. I went out there for a whole other type of job. And uh, I went out, I felt that at that time in my life, my contribution was going to be through radio and television. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about hip hop, with much respect to everyone involved in hip hop. Hip hop is much older than fiction. <laughs> I understand this phase of it. I understand the phase of it. See, this is what I mean when I talk about episodic history and holistic history. Episodic history is when you take incidences in isolation from the whole picture. But the challenge with that is that when you take that one episode if you don't understand the whole picture, then a lot of people can come in and claim that they were part of it. Like, for instance, I'll just give you an example. The Moors. Okay? We, we have this great history from 711 to 1492. But I did a presentation in Atlanta where I was talking about who were the Moors before the Moors. You have to understand holistic history. It's, it's like a puzzle that there are parts. The parts give you the whole picture. But if you just go with the part, you're only going to understand that part. We're at a point now where there are people who are claiming to have built the university at, of Timbuktu at saint Corinne, that they came all the way from the east to come all the way into Africa to build something they never built in their own place. And not only that, I would think that after you built Timbuktu, you would have gone back where you came from to build something like that there. Right. So why is it only in Timbuktu? It's because it was always there. Thank you. There have always been universities in West Africa. When our ancestors were building the pyramids in Kemet, West Africans were building kingdoms in West Africa. Don't believe me. I hope one thing that you will do, for those that may not know me, and I heard you say this, I hope you don't believe a word I say. I'm not here to make you believe you. I'm here to make you think. Because there's a lot of nonsense going on out there. Like I said, I want to thank the governor of Florida for what he said. He has told us something very important. He has told us, we want to go learn with this we, we can't burn it like this. And we can't forbid you to read. Well, we can't ban the books from getting the library. In fact, in Texas, they have built in libraries, they've emptied out the libraries and made them detention centers. Yeah. Listen to what I'm saying, family, because when you understand this, you'll understand one thing, how great you really are. We are so many. You will understand what you have achieved. Let me just tell you this. Back in the 80s, Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark took us to the museum of natural history, the American Museum of Natural History. And in this museum, there is a, a segment that has um, a toit and booty, derogatorily called pygmies, but they're the toit and booty, the koi style of Central and Southern Africa. It's up in a, this, this figure got red lips, red eyes, and all the other exaggerations that they went for. And he's got a, a blow dart in his mouth. And there's an animal that he's aiming at. Okay? When children come, because I was in the museum when I was much younger. It stayed there. And, and for the most part, a lot of people laugh. They think it's humorous. Because of the way in which they depicted this individual of the material. The first thing you have to know about the Chuat and Bushi is that that was the first human family. That is the entity of humanity that came out of the Homo sapiens sapiens, give or take about 200,000 years ago. They were conceived as a related to the creative thinker. 
They were hunters, they were gatherers, they began to fish, and then they became agriculturists. They were conceived, born, nurtured, sustained, educated, civilized, technologized. And after those Africans cut their show together, then they took it on the road and the people was planted. There's only one race on the planet. That's the human race. And he came out of the Twambu. So before you laugh at that entity that's up in the tree, you better think twice. Because that is your granddaddy and your grandma. And if it wasn't for them, we would not be sitting in this room right now. Because we have not been introduced to how great the Twa and Booty, short statured people, somewhere between three foot eight and their giants were five foot one. They were not derogatory, it's a derogatory to the Because the way in which you understand the difference between short people, they thought that they wanted to be called as opposed to dwarf, and the Twa and Booty, is that the distance between their navel and the top of their head is equally distant from their navel to the soles of their feet. They are perfectly proportioned. Within dwarfs, you might see that the head might be a little bit larger than the body, the arms might be longer than the, than the torso. So there, there's always something that is a little bit different in a dwarf or what might be called a midget. All derogatory terms, but I just want us to understand what we call it. The Twa and Buchi are perfectly proportioned human beings. They just happen to be short because they're the first beings. But check this out. Not far from them are the tallest people known as the Tutsis. Do you know how many years it must have taken a three foot eight to become about eight foot? Do you know years of existence? So that 200,000 mark is only what I'm giving you because that's what science tells us. I'm telling you, when we get back into our history, we're going back millions of years. Let me tell you something else about science. See, see they don't want to tell you this. And I don't blame them. And if they're not going to tell you, they're going to ban the book, that's going to tell you. So I don't mind them, because I got the books. You cannot cancel the future. You can postpone it, but you can't cancel it. Our time is coming, and don't let nobody tell you that black folk are looking for the good old days, because in America, black folk ain't never had no good days. So they ain't had good days, how can you have the good old days? Our greatest days are yet to come. And that's what I want to tell our children. I want them to understand that this is going to pass. This too shall pass. But there's a reason why we're here. We're here because we have the DNA of Mm -hmm. There's a book that's written in French by a brother, I'm glad. Yeah. It's called Le Chemin du Nil, which means the paths of the Nile, which talks about migrations of Africans going from the east to the west and west to the east. Break it down. We have to understand that Africa was a lively continent. There's a river that starts in the Atlas Mountains in Algeria and it winds down and exits in what we today call Southern Mauritania. Okay? About 5,000 BC, the area in North Africa that is now desert was very rich. The Ice Age that turned Africans into Indo-Europeans brought great rains to North Africa. And in so doing, the great rains came got down to the ground and, and, and just permeated the ground and poisoned the, the land because of the nature of not just water, which is good, but too much water came at too much time because of the ice age. We talk in geology, I'm talking science. Mm -hmm. This is why I want you to think that. This ain't emotion. What I'm telling you is that I would not do to our children what was done to their children to make them think that they were superior. I believe Dr. King was right. It is the content of their character. What you say right there. Okay? That is it. It is what you do with your spiritual system that makes you who you are. Right. Because if that was the case, well, I know some well melanated people in your acting. I ain't going to name no names. We're going to have no trouble with it. But you know, being melanated don't mean 
that old people become elders. Because not everybody elder. Elder is the position in the society. Okay, because ain't nothing, there's only one thing worse than a young fool. And that's the old. And that comes in many different cultural backgrounds. We have the blood of the migrations. There were pyramid builders that left the east and came west. They would have become the Tukulo people. They would have become the Dogon people. They would have gone into Senegal, to Ghana, the two people. You would have that there. You also have Nigerians in Kalet right. and in Kush. You have them in Southern Africa. There was lively trade going on in Africa. We get caught up in the exoticness of Kemet, not realizing that at the same time the pyramids were being built, they were building cities like Eredo in Nigeria. Google it, E-R-E-D-O, don't believe what I'm saying. Eredo was a city in Nigeria, 400 square miles. 400 square miles in, North, in Nigeria. You had the not culture that goes back thousands of years with the lost wax system of their art. In order to even do art, you've got to go through years of knowledge and wisdom before you can even think about becoming an artist. You have to be in a sense of affluence because there's survival and there's thriving. Survival is when you're trying to meet your basic needs. Food, clothing, shelter. Think. But once you get to that level where you are fluent in those basics, then you begin to thrive. And when you thrive is when you start making jewelry. It's when you start burying your dead. It's when you start doing all of the little things that you could never do in survival mode because you're too busy trying to survive. And so even the art, so, I just gotta do this. I'm just looking at this piece of art right here. Okay, Calhoun. Here's Calhoun Warrior. Now family, here's a couple of things that you gotta break down as you look in terms of education. And you know, I think that it was my um, good fortune. When I left Gary, Indiana, as a high school teacher, I came to New York in 1979. I started teaching in the Bronx. And I began by being an early childhood teacher. I was a kindergarten teacher. So, I mean, I, I mean, can you imagine me sitting on the floor, across the leg, reading books to children? Yes, I mean. Can you imagine a black man going into a kindergarten meeting of other teachers? Not only was I the only black person in the room, I was the only man in the room. Kindergarten, I want to get them before all the nonsense is written on their minds. Because I realized in high school, even as adults, a lot of stuff is going to be a race before you can write the truth. Beautiful piece. If I come before you and I tell you, okay, the people that we see out here now, blessings on their spiritual essence, as indigenous people, are not the first people. The first people were the Twa and Muti that came here according to my brother, Dr. David and Mocha, 120,000 years ago, black folk were in America, the first wave. And then the second wave was another black people that came as the Clovis Folsom people. The evidence of them is in New Mexico, in Clovis, New Mexico, and Folsom, New Mexico. Black people, taller stature, okay? They're on their way to Tootsie now. They moved Khoisan, and now they're going into Tootsie. The third are the Algonquin. The Algonquin are still a black people, but they have been impacted some by the icicles. Then you have the Inuit, the fourth migration of human beings that came to this continent. The Inuit are more the ones, derogatorily called Eskimos, that come across the Bering Strait. And then you have the Asian invasion. You have those Asians that are escaping Genghis Khan and what's called the Mongols. I don't like these words. These are all derogatory terms, but I'm using them because in books, that's what you're going to see. If I tell you what I believe they should be called, you wouldn't see it in the book because I believe they should call that. They say whatever Kaba say, you don't listen to it. You call them Mongol. And they were escaping Genghis Khan. They came over in very large numbers. 
And in so doing, they came in and they picked up the entire group. So the people that we see today, with the very straight hair, with the aquiline nose, you can see the African in them, but they are not the original people. Now people say to me, brother, you are a big car to me. And my response is, yeah. I am out of my cotton picking mind. The problem is you're in a cotton picking mind. No, we ain't having that. Truth knows truth. It's not about superiority or inferiority. That's not what I'm after. I'm not even after my truth. I'm after the truth. And that's the beautiful thing about education. Come on, bring your facts on the table. I'll put my information on the table. Let's chop it up. Let's talk about it. Let's see where we can go with this information. This figure. The first thing I want to know is, before they did it, Why? I don't want to talk about the people that did it. I want to talk about the people that first conceived the idea that they wanted to do I want to talk to the people that figured out the metallurgy of the tools that they'd be able to use that create the teeth up there. And then the way that the teeth come and they open up the mouth like here. I want to know, what tools did you use? But first, how did you know that that tool was stronger than the metal or whatever you were carving it on? You see, remember the twine booty up there? Remember the twine booty that was up in that tree? Do you remember the fact that Dr. Ben said, do you know the type of toxicology that they have to know in order to create a dart that would kill the animal? Do you know the zoology they have to know about that animal, that they would know that that poison would kill the animal? Do you know the type of biology they have to know that they could kill the animal with that poison, eat the animal, and that poison wouldn't kill them? <laughs> See, these are episodic. These are what I call superficial sapiens. Reporting on the deeds of super sapiens. How do, how do superficial people know? Super people. Hmm. No, you can't even figure it out. You can't comprehend. Yeah. Do you know how great you are? Mm. Come on, you are geniuses. Do, do you know what you've done? Do you know you, each and every one of you in this world, is a genius? Mm. Do you know what you, through your ancestral life, have achieved to get you in this seat? Don't make a difference if you work as a secretary. It doesn't make a difference if you work for FedEx. It doesn't mean anything if you're a curator of this museum. It doesn't make a difference where you are. It doesn't make a difference if you wait for the red light to come on and you bring a cup over to ask me for a dollar. Right. If you're black and alive in 2024, you're a giant. You're a miracle. And you have to know it when you go out there in the street. And you have to know that the reason why they're banning you from knowing who you are is because they know that the day that you figure out who you are, once you know better, you'll do better, and then in comes the new world order. And while we're talking about that, <laughs> I go to Dr. Sebi, I now go to his wife, Dr. Sebi of Joining Ancestors. I was going to Dr. Sebi since October 1988. Dr. Sebi and I became friends. And Dr. Sebi once came to one of my presentations I was doing on Melanie. I went back to the Usha Herbal Institute on Pacific Street. You know where Barclay Center is? They tore his center down to build Barclay Center. That's where, Bar that's where Dr. Sebi had his uh, Usha Herbal Institute. I used to go there, 616 Pacific Street in, the, in Brooklyn. 
In fact, that's where Barclay is right now. In fact, Barclay cuts the street in half. We're now, brother, you know, what, what made me go to Satan was I followed, there's an African-American newspaper called the Amsterdam News in New York. It comes out every Wednesday. And I had a subscription to it. And I was reading about this man who was an African herbal mineralist who had been arrested and was on trial for claiming that he could cure AIDS and diabetes and drug addiction. Hmm. And on, on October 1st, 1988, I was sitting on the bus reading the answer to their news and I saw that the brother was set free. And when I saw that, I thought, I got to know him. Because any black man that can get out with this, I got to know who this is. That Saturday, October 4th, 1988, I was sitting up in his center and I was checking out what he was offering. Dr. Sebi in all of his, and Sister Ma'a, his wife, in all of her teachings, there's one thing that we have to understand as a people. Because we, we all go on through all these different changes with all the herbs and things that we want to get to, and we, we want to get healed of all of our situations. But Dr. Sadie said the first step in healing is self love. You hear that? Yep. Self love, self care. How you gonna love anyone else if you don't love yourself? That's impossible. How do you know how to love someone else if you don't know self love? You may have another emotion for them, but it's not love. And I think of us as a people. I'm reading this book. The second time I'm reading is called the, Le the Delectable Negro. Get that book. You. <laughs> You need to read what we've been through as a people on these plantations. And you know, on one level, what has happened to our sisters as it relates to how they were treated, look, look at the young brothers too. Mm -hmm. you know, look at what happened to the brothers on the plantation. Right. You're dealing with a depraved, perverted people right. who any home will do. See, from our perspective, that we don't understand certain concepts of perversion. I'm not talking about LGBTQ. I'm talking about perversion. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Perversion. We're dealing with the people that were raised in the Ice Age. African people, by the way. Raised up in the Alps. Lonely people. Looking for love. And when the Ice Age ended, they returned back south and met a people that had not impacted by the ISIS. And they brought their depraved mentality down because you are a reflection of your environment. Because hmm. you know, last time I was in Louisiana, the weather was different. When I came here to Louisville, the last time we were here, the ice was on the ground. It was cold last time I was here. Now, I can go out without a jacket. Yes, sir. Okay? When we went the last time, we didn't go too many places. It was too cold. Even the car was, I don't think so. Yeah. But now, this morning we went over to the Muhammad Ali Center. We did some filming. Then, of course, we had to go over uh, to visit our sister, Brianna. We're, we're doing a... Um, a documentary on Louisville and there was no way I could come to Louisville and not make homage and tribute and do a libation to our sister Rihanna Taylor. That's right. Say her name. Say her name. Rihanna Taylor. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. Don't shoot my babies. I was out there. You know, there is a, um, there is a specific, I have a book that was written by a phenomenal young publishing company called Melanie Horizon. And the brother, Louis McLean, called me up and said, brother, I'm interested in, in doing a series on 
and I wonder if you'll support us and, and help us. I said, sure. As they were going through the process, they asked me, they said, what, which one is your favorite uh, characteristic of mob? You know, you got truth, justice, army, balance, order, arrangement. My, my favorite is recipe. What go around, you shall hear. Okay. And I asked the human family, do you really think you would conduct yourself if you knew that what you did would come back on you? Would you really treat people the way you treat them if you knew that the way in which you treat, even those that have the least, it'll come back on you sevenfold? It ain't just gonna come back on you. It's coming back seven times what you do. So if you do good things, it's gonna come back seven times. If you do not good things, is don't come back on your seven foot. Do you really think that you would create the mayhem and the murder mm. if you believe in reciprocity? So, the book Reciprocity was dedicated to me. Because I see a change is coming. A change is coming. It's already here, family. Mm -hmm. It's here. Reciprocity. You shall reap what you have sown. You will get what you give. Science, not emotion. What you call into, uh, into, uh, into existence is going to bounce off that wall like a rubber ball on cement and come back at you. Sevenfold. Because of the nature of the science of gravity. <laughs> Science. I, I, I'm not trying to pay nobody back. I don't have to pay nobody back. Oh. Because reciprocity say you won't get it anyway. For sure. I don't have to pray for your demise. You're already killing yourself. Well, look at them. Just ain't nothing but the Hatfields and the McCoys going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Sadie, when I was doing my presentation, and I went back, and I was talking to him. Dr. Sadie said to me, Booker T, at the time, I hadn't corrected my name. Because I didn't change my name. I corrected it. When the judge asked me, why do you want to change your name? I wrote back until I was correcting it. I was returning back to who I was before you changed. Oh, and it is something I got to pay to become who I am. And they changed me for free. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was worth every penny. Hey. He said, you're always talking about money, but it's carbon before money. All right, now. That's the name of my next book. Fact. Carbon before nothing. Creators on earth. When we said black power, black power, okay? But well, we said black power for a lot of different reasons. I found out why black is power. Because black is not only a divine color, black is actually the only color that exists. Stop breaking down. Get blue, draw a line. Then get indigo. Draw a line. Indigo, draw a line. Purple, draw a line. What do you think that one line color is? Black. It's black because black is the collection of all Everything. colors. Yeah. White is the deflection of color. Mm -hmm. I've got pictures of what happens to skin and to internal organs when the sun doesn't hit it. I'm not talking superiority or inferiority. In science, we call it dominant and recessive genes. Science. We're not personal here. Here's a research professor right here from MIT. So when you talk black power, do you really understand how correct you are? Black is not just power. Black is the essence of all colors that flow from it when you look at the infrared to ultraviolet spectrum. And see, black folk, see, see our challenge as black folk, we're six-dimensional people. And even okay? 
And we're living in a three-dimensional world. Break it down. We're, we're living in length, width, and depth. Okay? That is how we perceive the world around us. But when you have mastered length, width, and depth, you then go into the fourth dimension. And the fourth dimension is the time-space continuum. See, now I know that, you know, what I'm saying now, like I said, you know, I got to erase a lot of things before I can draw. See, this is all human nature right here. This is all, we are the masterpiece of the universe. Okay. And the idea is that the time-space continuum, like for instance, you came into existence to fulfill a divine destiny given to you before your mama and daddy even met. They were waiting for you to come into existence to do something. And you can't let this superficial Satan get in your way. But now I tell you, I'm going to tell it to you in a couple of minutes. Now I tell you how many people came into existence in order to bring you into existence. Now let me take another one. Out of all the buildings of spermatozoon that your daddy had, and all of the billions of eggs that your mama had. There was a select two that came together at a divine time. So not only how many people brought you into existence, how many people did not come into existence to bring you into existence? Do you know how great you are? Think about what I'm saying, family. So when you leave here today, you understand who you are. And why you have done all the things, good and bad. Having, don't have no regrets. Whatever you've done, whether you pimp, prostitute, drunk, began, bang, whatever you've done, you did in order for you to sit in this room right now and figure this out. Have no regrets. Now you can you can have, you know, you can have uh, apologies for some of the things you did to people. Okay? I'm not saying that that's not true. Uh -huh. But what I'm saying is, one of the things that we do is we carry intergenerational trauma, sure transgenerational hurt and pain with us. And we carry, and let me tell you something, as you become an elder, things get magnified. They become larger. I remember when I was, my, my mom was still with us. And I remember that I would remember things that I said to her that were not, you know, I never was hurtful or disrespectful in a sense, but you know, with young people, I love my mother and my father. Right. I loved them dearly, but you know, I was young, I was doing stuff, I was right. doing stuff. And I looked, and I got this thing. I ain't telling my story to them too old okay kids. Because if I tell you my story, they need to my body from the grave. They need to part, because you know, the statue of limitation don't run out on black people. <laughs> they say, uh, your honor, he's been dead 20 years ago. Bring his ass up here. Get his casket and bring it up. Bring his casket. The judge is saying you're guilty. Life. The lawyer said, your honor, he's dead. Life and death. Put him in the, put him in the cell. Put his casket with him. He buried his casket. Come on, we all carry history with us, so we understand this. We carry history with us. They'll bring the ashes back. <laughs> They'll bring that screen black and the screen thing. Bring it back to life. Oh, don't be scared. Yeah, well, well, they'll take every one of those drops of water and put it back together. Because they're going to get you, sis. <laughs> this is the way it is, fam. You know who we are, fam. We know who we are. You know you're great. Understand it. Feel it. Feel it. Wherever you are in your station of life, understand who you are and what you've done. I, 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 the, the more I learn about us, the more the love I fall with us. I know. I love you all. I love you more. Like Val, Omoto. I am because you are. Alright? I love you. I love you. See, you know, this is the African tradition. Because sometimes folk give presentations and people get involved in the presentation. 
But see, the African tradition is this. This ain't my presentation. This is our presentation. This is a meeting at the African Square. We get this in place. This is this is we in church. That's why black folk get so close up in church because that pastor be singing, dancing. He don't even know. Listen, let me tell you something. When 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 the old, when the Orishas came to this part of the world, what you say? The old, the, 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 old, the Orishas came and to and to our Spanish speaking brothers and sisters, they created Santeria. To our French brothers and sisters, they made Voodoo. When they went down into Brazil, they created Candomblé. When they was in the English speaking Caribbean, they had Obia. And when they were in America, they had Voodoo. All the same, there's only one spirit. All right. What spirit? With all of the ancestors we have, when you gather all them up, you only have them. Talk about it. And that one ancestor is the creator. Uh, and guess what? You are the creator. Uh, sure. Having yeah. a human yeah. experience. Yeah. So don't be looking out there for nobody. Don't be looking for everything in the wrong places. And get that. You are the creator having a human experience and you were brought here for a divine purpose to be one in nature, with nature, and to be able to answer all your questions. Nature will answer all your questions. If you sit, what do you do? Look at a dog. A dog will go put himself a little up to her side, she'll drink water and eat her. Next day, she up and running. We up here taking all this old nonsense, chemicalized stuff, and we still sick. In fact, we're sicker than we were before. Okay? Return back. You were born with all the answers. The book I wanted to write, the book that I wanted to write, I came in fact and my mother came home, gave me a Xerox copy of her book. And it was called Stolen Legacy by George G. M. James. And as I was reading this book, Xerox copy, from page 139 to 151, there was a, a chapter called the Memphite Theology that was rewritten on Shabbat this morning. By the way, I'm, I'm wrapping this up now. What I'm telling you right now is what I came to talk to. That's my presentation that I'm not going to get. Everything else I said before was only to get you ready for this. Okay, Shabaka Stone. I promised myself I was going to write a book on Shabaka Stone. I was so impacted. It revolutionized my thinking of cosmology and who I was as a person. It changed my whole direction as it related to my relationship with my entire environment. But before I wrote Shabaka Stone, I had to get the community ready for what Shabaka Stone was going to do. Because there was a lot of stuff I had to wipe off. Shabaka Stone is, in fact, the Old and the New Testament. That's where it came from. But here's what they did with, with uh, the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament basically deals with a history of, let's say, Hebrewism. The New Testament is the story of the Messiah that was to come after, which is the New Testament. Actually, the New Testament is the Amen priesthood, and the Old Testament is Akhenaten of the 18th dynasty, who existed thousands of years after the Amen priesthood was formed. So actually, the Old Testament is the New Testament, and the New Testament is the Old Testament, and if the devil wants to confuse you, he does not lie. All he does is give you one quarter truth and three quarter lie. You get so caught up in the one quarter truth, you forget that three quarters of what's going on is a lie. And if someone tells a perfect lie, the truth is unbelievable. Mm. Shabbat Stone was preceded by spirituality before religion. Because before you even read Shabbat Stone, I gotta get you to understand you are the creator having a human experience. The creator dwells within you. Not out here. You know, him pastors for himself. There are people that make a lot of money. Okay? And they'll make you think that they're the intermediary between you and God. 
The reality of it is, there is no intermediary between you and God because you are God. Well, there's no difference. There, there's no difference. See, we, see, we, we, you see, Dr. Ben used to always say, in order to have a God, you're going to have a balance. There's everything in nature shows you that there's a balance of mind. Okay? And one of the Kabbalah principles is the fact that you, that you have gender, that you have that balance. It's there. You've got it. Always. But now, before I wrote spirituality, before religion, you know, we're going to do libation. And so what I did is I wrote a book on William Leo Hansberg, who under no if, if we, you know something, Bobby Seale. Bobby Seale once told us that the Black Panther Party was first formed. The seed of the Black Panther Party came when there was an elder brother that used to stand on the corner in Oakland, California, teaching black history, like what I used to do. And Bobby Seale, by the way, you know, has a master's in electrical engineering. And he was also a stand-up comedian. <laughs> well, this is Bobby Seale we're talking about. Here. And so he got a hold of a young brother by the name of Huey P. All power to the people. All power to the people. Black power. And so they, they both come, decided that they were going to bring black studies program into the college system. That was the birth of the Black Panther Party, long before the other things happened. Before the dental, before the medical, before the legal, before the, uh, the, the, the uh, Saturday feeding program, okay, which I was a part of growing up, okay, and so that that was the birth of it. But this brother, William Leo Hansberg, uncle to Lorraine Hansberg, was the first brother to develop a black studies program in an accredited college in Howard University in the year 1922. And I said, before I go on my, because I'm, I'm not a writer. I write these books because I got something to say. I don't write because I'm a writer. I'm a much, I believe I'm a much better speaker. The way my brain functions, it functions better from my brain to my mouth. Some people, it's their brain to their hand. So they're writers. You see, you gotta own, own your greatness. But I said to myself, I gotta say this. So I'm gonna write it because I can't say it the way I'm gonna write it. But after I write it, I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna go to Louisville and I'm gonna talk about it. So William Leo Hansberg was my intellectual libation to the man that made all this possible in terms of black studies. Because everybody, indirectly or directly, have been impacted by William Leo Hansberg. Okay, Unambi Azikiwa was a student of William Leo Hansberg and credits him with giving him the intellectual and political knowledge to be able to come back and to become Nigeria's first prime minister and then president. Kwame Nkrumah, when he went to Lincoln University, he used to travel from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania to Washington, D.C. to sit in front of his brother William Leo Hansberg to learn his history to return back to Ghana to become the leader. So dangerous, they had to get rid of him. Patrice Mwamba, impacted by William Leo Hansen. Yeah. So before I did my thing, I said I'm gonna do a libation because they say that if you don't call upon your ancestors, you're acting alone. That's right. That's right. And so I called on William Leo Hansberry to guide me through this process. I then wrote spirituality before the living. I then wrote Shabbat Stone. And then from Shabbat Stone, I said, I gotta talk to the children, so I wrote Shabbat Stone for children. And I wrote Thoughts from Under a Black Light for our children. Family, I am so fortunate to be black in this day and age. Let me tell you something. You know, I'll be honest with you. I'm, and, I, and I tell this to my wife, I tell this to people that were listening, I never thought that what's happening now would happen in my generation. I knew it was coming, but I never knew it was going to happen so quick. But you see, nothing happens in your time. Right. It happens in divine time. This is such a powerful time to be alive. 
drive away. Even the earth, Gaia, the living earth is responding. And when you think it's supposed to be cold, I'm going to make it hot. And then when you think it's going to be hot, I'm going to snow on it. Because I want you to know that I want you to be still and know I am God. And that God grows within each other. Let that God come out. Because we got to talk to the children. Every African society that I've studied builds its whole nature to make the children better than them. It's only natural that the children would be better than the preceding generation. Not that they were better people, but because of all the great things that that generation did, it allowed them to ascend to a higher level. And if in your daily life, if you're in your society, you're not focused on the children, you're not focused on your future, and if you ain't focused on your future, you ain't going to be gone. Fast. Let me end with this. Solar power. In studying our ancestors, they understood the power of the sun. Much of what they built, they generated the power of the sun. From the mirror, or the root, which is called the pyramids. They call them um, the root, or mere single. To the temples. Even when they buried their dead, they all faced the east. Because they believed if the sun rose in the east, that their spirit would ride and raise back from whence they came. And when you're thinking about north, east, south, and west, let me really watch some stuff over. You gotta turn the globe. Because this thing they got this 23 and a third. See, when you go into space, there is no angle on Earth. Right. It's only the magnetism of the world. It is only the, the time-space continuum that doesn't allow you to understand. Look, fam, have you, have you ever been in a situation called deja vu? Yeah. You say, wait a minute, this happened to you. Yeah. But wait a minute. The book was written before you were there. So like if, like, if, like if you wrote a book and all of a sudden you read it and then all of a sudden you, wait a minute, I remember that. Well you should, you wrote the book. Deja vu doesn't exist. It's no twilight zone thing. It's only natural. The time-space continuum, you have been around for all time and all space. You have time as history. And geography is space. The, the essence of who you are has always been around. And you'll always be around. And that's why in Louisiana, they go to the cemetery crying and mourning, and they come back singing when the saints go marching in. Saints go marching in. Family, do you feel that? Do you, know, do, you, do you know that? Do you understand this in order for you to be able to go out here and deal with these superficial sapiens who know not the creator? And, and, and you just have to understand this as you move forward. And to be able to deal with these situations, because after you get into the fourth dimension, the time-space continuum, then you walk in the light. And that's why you see everybody talking about when they die, they see the light. Well, you could do that while you're alive. In fact, most of them that return back to the light only go back into existence from where you are, but you just don't know, because I'm going to turn all the lights out, you ain't going to see a thing. You find a light switch, you see all of the different artifacts, you see all of the pictures, you see all the things here. My question to you is, did all those things appear in the room when you turn the light on? No, they were always there. Your light does one norm. So turn on your light. And after you turn on your light, then you've got gravity. And gravity is your footprints that you leave on the planet for what you've done on it. And you're in six dimensions. You're living in a three-dimensional world as six-dimensional people trying to figure out why we act the way we act. I'm not surprised that we act the way we act because, quite frankly, when you think about your okay, you tell us about, you know, crab gets up. Okay, I understand. Okay, listen, every time a crab gets up, one of the crabs pulls it down. Okay? We don't let each other get out. But I want to remind you, if you took that basket of crabs, returned them back to their natural environment, and put them in the water, Crabs actually help each other. 
Crabs stack themselves on each other so that the one on the top eats. And when the one on the top eats sufficient, it comes down and pushes the group up in the second one. That's right. It comes down and then it pushes it up in the third one comes and eats. So if you take a natural entity and put it in an un unnatural environment, it is natural for the natural entity to act unnatural in an unnatural environment. Wow. But return that natural entity back to its natural environment, it'll start acting natural. It'll, it'll pull the gun away from each other. Nice. It'll understand you're not my enemy. And your good is my good. As you rise, I rise. We rise. Nice. So it's important that we understand this. Yes, and we move away from this nonsense con conversation. Solar power is the future wealth of the planet. Family, keep on, keep it on. Keep on, keep it on. Because it ain't over to be. It ain't never gonna be all power. All power, power to the people. All power to the people. Us. All power to the First Nation people. Us. 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 Black power. Ubuntu.